but welcome to this tutorial. You've just seen what we are going to try and achieve. This is a tutorial about wet maps. I've done two earlier tutorials on wet maps, one of which looked at the case of a static object, uh, the second of which looked at what you can do when the object is moving. And in this case, we're going to look at an object that's both moving and deforming, which is, of course, in some ways the most difficult case. And I've set up a FEM simulation here of the squab falling on this slope and rolling down. You can see it there. I'm not going to go into detail about how I set this up, uh, just to say I've cached it out here so that we're not going to use this auto.network. Uh, in fact, we're just going to rely on the cached simulation. So the first step is going to introduce to be to introduce some some liquid into this scenario. And to do that, I'm going to create another auto.network because I've cached out uh, this auto.network. Uh, I don't want to use that. And you can do that down here. You won't be able to see it on the video, but if you right click, you can create new simulation. And that automatically both creates a new auto.network and sets it as the default. So any of the shelf tools up here will start using it. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that this slope is in as a collision object. But if we go into the slope object, uh, we've actually got two versions of the slope. The version we can see at the moment is thin, but I've also uh, created this version here, which is thick and we can use for collisions. So uh, let me put the, um, the display flag down here, perhaps. And then we can go onto the shelf tool here collision object and click static object. And what that should do is bring into our auto.network that object, which it has. So let's now introduce the water and I'm going to use the flip tank tool and I'm going to hit enter to put that at the usual place. And I need to move it downwards. So let's just move this out and then move it downwards. Now you can see as we move it downwards that the, the particles making up the liquid actually stay in the same place. If I move it too far down you get this weird thing where the, the particles are actually above the tank. And I need to give it a bit of space above here and I need to make sure it's wide enough in this direction because we're going to have some splashes coming out of the end of it, like so. Now to lower the, the level of the particles here, we can use this control here. That moves it up. We need to move it down. Like so. Let me just have a look at the top of this. Of course, it's not it's not wide enough, so let's shift and click on this, and then you can move both sides at once, like so. That's a little bit too far down. How about that? That should be okay. Now the problem we've got at the moment is that we've got some fluid here, but we've also got some fluid here that we don't want, and the fluid is intersecting with our slope. Now in the flip tank set up here that the, the shelf tool has created. Uh, we have a network. This is inside the node called flip tank initial. And the network has a node at the top here which says merge collisions. And this is just a simple object merge, but it allows you to merge in geometry which is going to be around the, the fluid, where the fluid places where the fluid won't be. So the first thing we need to do is import our slope, like so. And now you can see that the, the fluid has ceased to be here. Uh, there's still a bit at the end there, which suggests we've, we've overdone the size of the box. But we've got a lot here, which we don't want. There are different ways of getting rid of it, but one of them is simply to lay down a box, and we'll call it fluid mask. And I'm going to move it down here, 
move it along here and increase the size of it. But I've done a classic mistake in Houdini, which is to edit at the object level when I actually want to edit in the geometry level. So again, let's move it down across. Again, shift click this one and we can move both sides at once. Shift click this one and we can move both, side, both sides at once and shift click this one and this one. There we go. And now we've got something covering it's a little bit too far across there. There we go. So that now masks off the fluid that was appearing here. And that means if we go into our flip tank initial, into the merge collisions, we can click this plus button and that allows us to import a second object. So if we just select that box, uh, which we called mask, have a look, see where that is. Fluid mask, there we go, accept that. And you can see now that fluid has been deleted. The other thing I need to do is just correct the size of this box by moving that in just a little bit. There we go. So while we're here, let me just point out what things that flip tank shelf tool did. It created this network flip tank initial, which is the one we've been editing. And this is what sets up the box for the flip simulation and also the initial particles. And you can see that down here. It also creates two other nodes, uh, flip tank fluid and flip tank fluid interior. So the flip tank fluid is the surface of the fluid. That's what's used to render the surface of the fluid. And then the flip tank interior, the fluid interior is going to use, be used to, to render the interior of the fluid. Now, in fact, we're not going to use the interior because we're going to have a, an opaque fluid, rather like paint. So I'm going to switch that off for the moment. The next thing to do is to bring in a squab, which we're going to use to splash around in the fluid. So let me create a new geometry node. And let's call this, say, wet squab. And the first thing I'm going to do is bring in that cached out simulation, which I've got here somewhere it's that and this should mean that we get yeah the squab coming in here let me make sure I've got the other version of the squab the one that was used in the earlier simulation let's switch that off the advantage of separating out these uh, two networks is it makes it easier to understand what's happening so that's why I've separated this version of the squab, which is the one that's being simulated from this one, which is the one which we're going to use to interact with the liquid. And you might even have those two simulations in different files. It's quite common to have the situation that you're loading in geometry that's been simulated earlier. Anyhow, we need to make this into a collision object, and we're going to use a, a deforming object like so, and that should have set up in the auto.network. Let's have a look. Yes, it has. So lay that out. Uh, we can see we've got the flip tank here. We've got the slope as a solid object, and then we've got the squab as a deforming static object. So let's see whether the, the simulation now works. I'm playing this in, in real time. It's simulating pretty pretty well and yep we're getting the liquid coming up and splashing over let me just turn off the display of that fluid mask box there we are it's pretty low resolution at the moment but uh, for the purposes of this tutorial we can we can leave it at that So the next uh, thing to do is to work out how to create a wet map for the squab. And 
the classic way that you do this is to scatter a large number of points on the object where you want the wet map to appear. You then use an attribute transfer to increase a wetness attribute on those points when they're close to the liquid. And uh, you then use a solver node to make sure that that wetness attribute doesn't get recalculated at every step but accumulates. So let's, uh, let's do that. And there's a particular, a couple of particular steps that you need to take uh, with the situation you've got here, which is a deforming object. Let's go into the squab and let's start off. So we've got our file here. So let's scatter some points onto the squab. And I'm going to scatter say 10,000 points, or let's say 5,000 points, that should be enough. And if I look, there we are, we can see there's plenty of points covering the whole, the whole object. But the problem is uh, that, of course, it's deforming, so those points will change position every frame if we rescatter them on every frame. So we don't really want to do that. What we want to do is make sure that we scatter them on the first frame. So in fact, let me, a couple of ways we can do this, but what I'm going to do is just make sure we pick up the first frame and then feed that in here. So those points are now static. If we run our simulation, uh, we should see that the let me just template the file. We can see that the squab is falling down, um, but the points that we've scattered are not. And of course, that's going to be a problem. We need the points to follow the squab. But we can do that uh, using a couple of nodes, which are in fact designed for cloth simulations, but work brilliantly in this case. And those are the cloth capture and cloth deform nodes. So what these do uh, in combination are, uh, are to allow you to deform or move a set of points according to what's happening to another object. So in this case, we want our points to follow the movement of the squab. And this is exactly what these tools will let us do. So the first one we need to use is the cloth capture, which I'll lay down here. It has two inputs. Um, the geometry to capture, which is going to be our points, and the the cloth to capture with. Cloth, in this case, is actually a is actually just the squab. Now, what we're going to use is the initial state of the squab here, which is this file node. Let me make this clear file first frame. And when we click on this, we can see we get a huge number of circles. Uh, this shows you the radius that's being searched in order to connect the points that we scattered with the geometry of the squab. So I'm going to take this radius right down, let's say 0.1. I happen to know that this works reasonably well. Um, and then what we need to do is deform this. That is, move the points as the squab moves. So let me down a cloth deform. And this takes three inputs. The first input is the geometry to deform, which is the output of this cloth capture. The second is the rest cloth, and that is, that's, in other words, the squab in its, in its unchanged state, which is the first frame. And then the final input is the deformed cloth, in other words, the squab as it deforms and moves around, which is the rest of the frames here. So what we should now see, if we click on this, is that as it moves, let me just get rid of the templating on this so that we can see it more clearly, but as it moves, this
this should move perfectly with the squab, and it does. So the next thing uh, we need to do is to attribute transfer and attribute from the, the liquid over to these points. So first of all, let's find the particles that make up the liquid, and they will be in the flip tank fluid node. Let's lay this out. This is a standard node which you get from all of the shelf tools for fluids. And the key part we want is here, the import flip tank. And if I middle click on this, hopefully we can see you get various fields out of this. Um, but you get a point group called particles. And that are, those are the particles that make up the fluid. So I want a blast node. And I want to connect the output of the DOP import into that. And then I want to choose the particles, and I want to delete non-selected. And that's going to leave us with just the points that make up the fluid, with the rest of it deleted. And then let's add a null at the end. And let's call this particles. And then back in our Squab geometry with our wet map, we can let's move this. Let's move this all a bit further over so we've got some space. So the next thing I need to do is object merge in those particles that we just tank fluid particles. There we go. And then we're going to need a solver node. But before we do that, we're going to need to set up some attributes. So for both of these sets of nodes, we're going to need some attributes. So let's use an attribute create. And the two attributes we're going to need are wetness. Oops. Wetness. And if you click the plus button here, I can create, and the default value of that, by the way, is zero. And it's just a float, a single float value. And then we add another one, which we're going to call old wetness. And that can also have a value of zero. I mean, you do exactly the same thing on here. And then we need a solver. Uh, the difference, by the way, I should have said, is that on this one, uh, the wetness value needs to be 1. Because, of course, all of the particles that are in the fluid are wet. So let's attach the initial particles, the deformed partic particles, into the first input, so the wet map particles that is, and into the second input we'll connect the particles that we've imported from the liquid simulation. So I've laid down a solver node, and a solver node is a particular node in a geometry network which allows you to calculate values based on the previous frame, based on the values of the previous frame. Normally, in a SOP network, what happens is that at every frame, the whole network is evaluated, and you come up with a result, the position of the, of the object, and so on. So inside a normal SOP network, you can't look back and see what the value was at the previous frame and use that to calculate the current value. That kind of calculation, evolving from frame to frame to frame, is what happens in a dynamics network. So you have to have a sort of dynamics context in order to look back at previous frames. I'm generalizing. There are ways of getting around it. But in any case, the solver node allows you, within a standard SOP network, to look back and to, to evolve 
an attribute based on the previous frame's value. And that's very important for what we're going to do now. So let's have a look at these inputs. So I'm going to rename them so that we remember what they are. So input one is deformed wet map points. And input two is fluid particles. And we're going to use these to calculate our transfer of wetness. So the first thing I'm going to do is do an attribute copy. An attribute copy is needed because we want to use the position of these deformed wet map points, but we want to use the wetness value from the previous frame. And why do we need the wetness value from the previous frame? Because we want, we want it to be the case that once an area of the model is wet, it stays wet. We don't want it to become dry again as soon as it moves away from the fluid. That's not how wetness works. Wetness is persistent. So in this case, we need to copy from the previous frame points to the current frame points. I think that's the right way around. Oh, it's the other way around. So we need to copy to the points that are in the current frame from the previous frame, like so. And I'm going to copy an attribute. I'm going to copy wetness. And I can get rid of CD. We don't need that. So now uh, I've copied the wetness value from the previous frame onto the current points. And then I can do an attribute transfer, like so. And again, I'm transferring them on to the current points, and I'm transferring them from the fluid particles. And the, we're transferring a point attribute, and we're transferring a wetness attribute. And the conditions you need to experiment with this. This I've done a whole separate tutorial on attribute transfer, but this essentially tells you how far uh, it's going to look to transfer the attributes. I'm going to give it a value of 0.2, I think, and see uh, whether that works. So this is transferring wetness. So let's just label this so that we know. So this is going to replace the wetness attribute at every frame. But as I said, what we want to do is make sure that wetness is persistent. We want to make sure that if the wetness, if, if a point is no longer in contact with a liquid, but has been in contact in the past, it stays wet. And that's where this old wetness attribute comes in. So I need to do a little bit uh, of attribute wrangling here. And all I'm going to do is set at old wetness which is the old wetness attribute, to the wetness attribute. So this is saving the value before the attribute transfer. And then after the attribute transfer, we want to do one more calculation. which is at wetness equals max at wetness at old wetness. So this is going to make sure that if a point has already been wet, it will stay wet. Because if it's been already been wet, the old wetness value will be high, and the new wetness value will, if it's zero, uh, will be replaced by the old wetness value. Now, if you wanted to do sophisticated things, like having your, your points dry out over time, uh, you could also do that calculation here. And I'll rename this. Uh, let's say, preserve wetness. So if this has worked, um, we, can, uh, we should be able to now Have a look. What's happened to that? There we go. 
I'm going to add a color sop to this so that we can visualize what's happening. And a color sop colors your points. And one of the options is to color a ramp from attribute. And the attribute I'm going to use is wetness. And indeed, it does have a range of 0 to 1. And let's have it say uh, white at the bottom. And then say blue or something at the top like that. And what this should mean, if this has all worked, is that as this rolls through the water, the points should change to blue. And there we are. You can see almost the whole squab is turned to blue. Little tiny bit not turned to blue. Maybe I've got that radius a bit high. Let's uh, let's change the attribute transfer radius down to 0.05 and see whether we get slightly less spreading of the wetness. Let's try again. There we go. Just You can experiment with, with that value of radius. In order to demonstrate later on the rendering, uh, I, want a, I want a squab that has a bit of wet and a bit of dry, so we'll leave it at that, though it's probably not terribly accurate. So now we're going to look at how you can take these points, which hold a wetness value, and use them in rendering. In the previous versions of, of these tutorials, or the tutorials, earlier tutorials on wet maps, I used a, a Houdini shader to read in the point cloud and then affect the shading that way. Today I'm going to look at how you can create a series of maps which can then be used on any renderer that supports uh, maps. Uh, and the way we need to do that is to reference these points not using their position but using a UV coordinate. And we can do that providing we have a UV coordinate on our points. And at the moment, uh, we don't. So on this scatter node, I need to make sure that there is a UV attribute here, a vertex attribute, UV. So I need to make sure that we take the UV from the vertex attribute and the scattered points are using UV and that's been picked up. So let me now cache these points out. And I'm going to use that I've already cached some out, but uh, let's call it final wet map. And we're going to frame range 1 to 100. And let's save the disk. That'll take a moment to render out. Like so. And then we can use a COP or compositing network to create our maps. There we are. So let's go into a compositing network and let's create a compositing network uh, which we will call wet map render for example. And the first thing we need to do is create uh, what's called a VOP generator. And a VOP generator allows you to use a VOP network, in other words a network of of VEX nodes to create an image. And we need to set the size of the image up here. And you could set any square image you like, but I'm going to have mine at 1024 by 1024. And let's dive inside. I'm going to enlarge this. And we get outputs on this side and a range of global variables on this side. The one that we are interested in is down here. 
which are called x and y. So x and y tell you the position of the pixel that's currently being evaluated. So what this what this node will do is it'll go through every pixel in that 1024 by 1024 image and it will use this network to calculate the color of that pixel. And the current position uh, of th that you're evaluating is set by these two, which vary between 0 and 1. And of course, UV coordinates also vary between 0 and 1, and therefore you can use your X and Y as UV coordinates. And the thing we need to do uh, to access those points is to use one of the point cloud nodes. And the, f the first thing you need to do is have point cloud open. And this allows you to open a file and then look at the points inside it. So I'm going to promote this right click, whoops, the middle click rather here and promote this pri file parameter. I'm also going to promote the radius parameter and the max points parameter, like so. And this is uh, going to allow me to set the file, how far we search, which affects the rate, the, 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 the how it's rendered, and the number of points that we search for. The key thing is that we need to set the position channel. Instead of P for position, we need to set it to UV for UV. And then we need a float to vector converter, and we need to feed in the x component here, which varies between 0 and 1, and the y component to the second field, which varies between 0 and 1, and feed that in to the point position p. And what this is going to do uh, later on is it's going to look for points whose uv coordinates are near the pixel, the UV pixel that we're evaluating, and it's going to look for the value of wetness. And we can do that using something called a point cloud filter. And the output of the point cloud open is a handle, and that handle sort of identifies the point cloud we're looking at, and we need to feed that in there. And the point cloud filter, we need to tell it what we are looking for. And we're looking for wetness, and it is a float channel, like so. And then we're going to feed that value into the R, G, B colors of our output. So what this should mean is that at each frame, we're going to visualize the wetness on a map. And the map is going to be white, where things are wet and it's going to be black where things are not wet and that's going to correspond to the UV coordinates of our squab model. So let me recap. What this is doing is it's getting the UV coordinates of the current point in the image. It's looking in that point cloud, in those points that we wrote out earlier. It's looking for points which have a nearby UV value. It's then evaluating the value of wetness nearby, coming up with an average, and then we're feeding that in to our output. So if we minimize this and look at our composite view, uh, what we should see, wait a second, that's right, it, uh, it's complaining because we don't have a point cloud. Right. And the search radius I'm going to put down to 0 0.05. Let's leave it at 10 points for the moment and see what we get to. Of course, for the first few frames, everything is black because uh, there's been no contact with the water. But let's go up to one of the later frames. Here's frame 74. And that shows you that... In fact, let's, let's play through it. You can see... It's gradually getting whiter and whiter and whiter as more and more areas get into contact with the liquid.
So you may have a rendering system, another renderer, which allows you to use this map directly. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create two maps using this map. I'm going to create a roughness map, and that will tell you how reflective the surface is. And I'm going to adjust the color map of the squab. Obviously, wet areas are going to be more reflective, less rough, and they're also going to be a bit darker. So what I need, first of all, is to get the diffuse image, the diffuse color from the squab model. And that doesn't come in the standard directories, but you can export it. And I'll just show you how to do that. If you go right back to the test geometry squab here, and you right click on it, and you won't see this, but there is a option right at the bottom called type properties, which brings up the properties of this type of node. And if we have a look at extra files, we can see that there's a file called squab diffuse. And right at the bottom here, uh, you can save as a file. And that would allow you to export this JPEG for use elsewhere. I've already done that, in fact. So we can go back to the image network and I can bring in the squab picture from texture squab diffuse. Uh, and as you can see, let's just visualize that. That's the texture that goes with the squab. So first of all, let's do the roughness map. And of course, Roughness, when roughness is high, it's less reflective. When it's low, it's more reflective. So in fact, we want the inverse of this for our roughness map. I've inverted that. So white areas are going to be rough and dull. Black areas are going to be reflective. And then I want a ROP file output. And I want to make sure that I'm putting this out to a file. Now, in fact, I have already rendered out these, but let's do it again as a, and I'm rendering out 100 frames, and in fact, let me pause the video while that renders out. And the other thing I want to do is to change this diffuse map so that the areas that have touched the liquid have a, have a blue color. So let's uh, put down a color node, and let's choose um, a blue, like that. And I want it to be 1024 by 1024. And I'm going to use an over node. This is going to enlarge this. This is going to put the blue color over the top of the diffuse. And at the moment, as you can see, it's just completely covering everything. But we need a mask. And what we need is the blue color to be in the areas that are white in our wet map. So we can do that. And now what we should see is, let's see whether that's something's gone wrong here. And the reason that's not working is because the mask is trying to find, we click on the mask tab here of the overnode, it's trying to find the alpha for the input image for this image here. And there isn't one. What we, of course, need is uh, the color. So once we do that, we can see that some areas are blue, some areas are the original map. I don't want that to be 100%. So we can, on this slider here we can put the foreground weight say down to 0.7 and then as you can see you see a little bit of the original detail and I need to output this and again I think I've got uh, that prepared already and then we can render that which I will do and uh, pause the video so all that remains to be done is to set up uh, a render for this. So let me 
go to our material tab and what have we got we've got clay which is on the slope we've got the basic liquid which is being used to render the particle fluid and we've got a uniform volume that's actually not used that's if we were rendering the interior of the fluid i'm going to adjust the the basic liquid so that it's not refracting and i'm going to change the color somewhere to match the color that we're using for rendering um, to match this color here and then we need a material which is going to be used for the squab itself and I'm going to call this squab shader and we need to set it up the base color can be white because we're going to use a texture for the base color and the texture we're going to use is of course the diffuse texture that we rendered out and the other texture we're going to use is for roughness And then on the first tab, we must make sure that the roughness is set up to 1 because it will be multiplied by the texture. And I think that should work. So let's have a look at our scene view. Go back to the objects. And we've got our wet squab here. Let's make sure the display is on the right thing which is going to be this the file the incoming squab and let me go up and make sure that we're using that shader that we've just created now one point to note is that roughness maps don't seem to work correctly when you're using OpenGL rendering. Uh, the, the roughness doesn't appear to calculate properly. So I'm going to do a couple of quick test renders here. Uh, have I got a mantra render node set up? Doesn't matter. Let's look through the camera. Click render. And hopefully what we're going to come up with here is a squab that has some blue areas and that doesn't seem to be working right now. Just double check that again. Have I enabled the Okay, the problem is that we have a default shader embedded into our squab. Let me just show you that. If I have a look at this file and middle click, we've got this attribute shop material path. And that's overriding the shader that we've put up here at the object level. So we need to delete that attribute, uh, which we can do using an attribute delete. And we need to delete attribute material there we are and we should now find yes uh, that our squab has some blue areas and we can see they're nice and reflective so that's a quick look at how you can create a wet map for a deforming object um, I hope it's been useful